Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the University of Leicester. My name is Henrietta O'Connor, and I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor and Head of the College of Social Sciences, Arts and Humanities. I'm delighted to have been asked to introduce Professor Matthias Dahm's inaugural lecture this evening and to welcome you all. I'd particularly like to welcome Matthias's friends and family this evening. A benefit of the virtual lecture is that it's far more accessible and guests who may not have been able to attend a real life event are able to be here tonight. Having said that, the downside is that the speaker is not able to see their family and friends in front of them as they deliver this key lecture in their academic careers. And it's something that I always really enjoy about an inaugural lecture is seeing the family and friends enjoying their, um, their loved one's moment of glory. This evening's event is an important part of the university's centenary celebrations, and it's the second inaugural lecture in the series from our college. A hundred years ago marked the start of our story and our legacy as a university to honour those who made sacrifices during the Great War. Thank you for joining us this evening to mark this historic milestone and to celebrate the new chapter in Professor Darm's career. Since joining Leicester, Matthias's career has gone from strength to strength. We're very proud of him and his work, and we're looking forward to hearing directly from him this evening about the work he's been doing over the course of his career. Before passing over to Matthias, please welcome Professor Jim Devlin, Dean of the Business School, to say a few words. Thank you, Henrietta. Uh, and on behalf of the University of Leicester School of Business, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the inaugural lecture of Professor Matthias Dahm, entitled The Economics of Contemporary Slavery. And we hope to find out more as to why modern day slavery is such an intractable problem and why it's, where and why it is impacting on society. And I'm sure it will be a most interesting and stimulating talk. Matthias is originally from Germany and he studied for his undergraduate degree in economics and management at the University of Bochum in the town where he spent his childhood. But he also spent a year at Louis Pasteur University in Strasbourg when studying for his undergraduate degree. It was during this time that Matthias met his future and now wife who is Spanish. So we should perhaps not be surprised to learn that Matthias completed his PhD at the Autonomous University of Barcelona. Although I'm sure it's the quality of the institution and supervisory arrangements that proved the main attraction for Matthias. Matthias's PhD explored the topic of when countries are stable and when they break up, for instance, into several political units. And being half Scottish myself, this is a topic of particular interest to me at the moment. After that, Matthias joined Kellogg School of Management at Northwest University for a two year postdoc appointment. And during his career, he has also spent long term research days at the University of California, Irving and the Free State uh, Free University in Berlin. Before coming to the UK, he taught at several Spanish universities, including the University of Alicante, the University of Carlos III of Madrid and the University of Rivera al Vigerli. Uh, where he held his first professorship. Immediately before coming to Leicester, he taught at the University of Nottingham, which is something he has in common with me. Matthias is a renowned microeconomist and an applied game theorist, and his research fields are industrial and health economics, as well as public and political economics. His outputs and publications have appeared in the Economic Journal, the Journal of Public Economics and the Journal of the European Economic Association, amongst many others, and he is a popular and committed educator. Outside of work, Mateus is a committed family man and he enjoys getting to know and introduce his children to different language and cultures. Without further ado, I now pass you over to Mateus for his inaugural lecture. Good luck, Mateus. Thank you very much, Jim. It's an honour to be here. Uh, hello everyone, welcome to my inaugural lecture. Thanks to my friends and family and to my colleagues uh, for being here. As Henrietta said, it's a pity that we cannot have this event in person, but also there's an upside. The online nature of it implies that some friends and family are here with us today who would otherwise, under normal circumstances, not be able uh, to come to Leicester, and that is great. So allow me please uh, to welcome them. Hola a todos que os conectáis desde España. Bienvenidos a este evento. Und herzlich willkommen an alle, 
die sich aus Deutschland zugeschaltet haben. Schön, dass ihr da seid. I will now start to share the slides. And I will take off the head. So, um, the economics of contemporary slavery. Um, during this lecture, we will explore how and what economics can contribute to our understanding of the phenomenon of modern slavery. But first, as is customary to such a lecture, let me acknowledge uh, my intellectual debt uh, with institutions. People will come at the end. So as Jim said, um, I did my undergraduate degree in Bochum and I also, I was born there and uh, grew up in Bochum. So during this lecture, I will use the cursor as a pointer. So you see, I point to the uh, map of Germany uh, on the left of this slide and the red dot that is Bochum, it's in the west of Germany, im tiefen Westen, as we say. And it's very close to Düsseldorf. You might have flown into, into Germany to Düsseldorf airport. And um, that is half an hour away. And um, uh, if you're interested in the Champions League, uh, Dortmund is very close to, um, uh, to Bochum too. So this is the Ruhr Valley, which is uh, the largest urban area in Germany. And there are more than five million people uh, living in this area. And in Bochum, there is a history of, of coal mining. And um, that has changed in, um, in, in recent years. And the university is part of that change. So the university is the Ruhr University of Bochum, Ruhr Universität of Bochum. And um, I'm presenting this as if you were not familiar with Bochum, but you might actually know us because of our uh, glorious football team, uh, the VfL Bochum. And um, yes, we are currently in second division. Uh, but we are coming back. Um, we are currently um, about to go back into the first division. You might have met us in 97 in the UEFA Cup, uh, where we were under the um, among the last 16 until we met Ajax Amsterdam. So, um, as Jim said, I studied at the Ruhr University Bochum which is one of the largest universities in Germany, and I studied economics and management. And I spent a year in, in Strasbourg, um, by the way, with an Erasmus um, scholarship, and that was an important um, experience for me, uh, not only because uh, of what um, um, Jim has pointed out, that I met my future wife, but also it was an opportunity for me to, to learn a language and actually um, realized that I could learn a language. So um, after Bochum, as Jim said, I, I, I went to Spain um, to the Autonomous University in Barcelona and to this IDEA program. IDEA stands for International Doctorate in Economic Analysis. And that was a very, very important experience for me because it is an American style PhD program with two years of coursework um, where they brought us to the research frontier and um, I, I learned a lot. So my thesis advisor was Salvador Barbara, who recently gave a seminar here at the University of Leicester. And of course, he was a great source of inspiration and an important mentor throughout my career. Uh, from then, my first job was in Alicante for just a year, a little over a year. Um, but that was important for me because I started two co-authorships in Alicante, one with Jose Alcalde, and one with Nicolas Portero. And we have written many papers together. And so in this sense, this was really uh, a very productive um, 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 step for me. Uh, in Alicante, I got interested in different kinds of, of political economy questions. Um, those that um, relate to the political process and how countries take their political decisions. And so I, um, I, um, applied for this postdoc uh, two years at the Kellogg School of Management of Northwestern University. And I visited a group of political scientists and economists working in this area. And my host was, was David Austin Smith. And again, that was a wonderful learning opportunity. Back in, in Europe, I spent a year at uh, University Carlos III of Madrid 
where I started working with Luis Corchon. And after a year, I changed to uh, the University Rovira e Virgili in the province of Tarragona. The econ department is in Reus. And um, there uh, I spent a longer period of time. And, and that was very important for me because it was the place where I could develop my research and publish uh, my papers. It was also important because um, it allowed me in Spain, there is a system where you can have sabbaticals um, that last a year and that make um, traveling with young children much easier because you can be away for the whole school year. And so I I took advantage of this and, and went to the Free University of Berlin, Berlin, where I worked with um, Helmut Bester and I went to the University of California, Irvine, where I visited Stegios Caperdas and worked with Ami Glaser. And my first um, appointment here in, in, in this country was at the University of Madrid. So um, back to my inaugural lecture. Um, the question today is what the dismal science can contribute to our understanding of modern slavery? And so dismal science is a label that is very often given to, um, to economics. And um, it is often meant derogatory. So why, um, where does this label come from? Well, the label comes from the Victorian historian uh, Thomas Carlyle in the 19th century. And uh, Carlyle wrote about the West Indies and wanted to reintroduce slavery. And so he looked at economics because he wanted to find a justification in order to restore slavery in that part of the world. And so he couldn't find what he was looking for. And for this reason, he described as dismal the economists opposed to slavery. And so one might say that economics was on the side of morality and against racism. And I think it still is. So today, however, I will be less concerned with what one could describe as historical slavery. And I would like to talk more about the so-called modern slavery. So um, here is a quote to, um, to set the stage. This is a quote by the chief executive of Anti-Slavery International. Um, that is the first or the world's oldest human rights organization, uh, which was funded in 1839 as the British and Foreign Anti-Slavery Society. And so he is worried about uh, Brexit and the need to um, to negotiate uh, trade agreements. And he says it is hard to see how the UK can take a lead on fighting slavery when Brexit has forced the prime minister to negotiate with economists driven by exploitation. So what he is worried about is that um, in some parts of the world, um, goods are produced uh, based on slave or forced labor and that these goods are then sold and exported into other countries that import that risk of slavery tainted goods. And so uh, this is the kind of issue that I would like uh, to talk about today. So uh, this lecture is based on my recent work. Um, you see it is co-authored with a, a wonderful set of co-authors and it has also uh, had funding from the British Academy and the Leverhulme Trust, which is gratefully acknowledged. Um, so both papers are unpublished and in this sense uh, work in progress. And um, I think they are important issues. And so I hope that this topic is of interest to this broad and diverse audience. So uh, given this diverse audience of on one hand economists and on the other hand uh, non-economists, I have a, a double objective. So on the one hand, I would like to tell you a little bit about what we have found out in relation to, uh, to modern slavery, but I would also like um, to show the non-economists how economists think about those things. And the reason is, is simple. After all, it's, it is not well known what academic economists do. And I know that my friends and family have secretly been 
wondering for a long time, when he is not teaching, what is he doing? And so I thought um, I uh, give this reply. So um, the idea of this research program is that the two papers uh, complement each other. The first one looks at the effect of trade on forced labor and has both a theoretical and an empirical analysis. The second one is theoretical and um, has a broader focus and looks be besides the issues of trade also at other issues like uh, technological progress. So my hope with this project is that from the two papers, a unified view emerges that the both papers complement each other in the sense that they have both theory and empirics, but also that there are different types of theory. And um, this theory that we use is, um, these are classical models of, of trade. And so it is what we teach our students in the undergraduate degrees. And these are the, the models where our professional intuitions are based on and where much of the policy advice comes from. So I hope you find this interesting. So um, the questions today include, what is modern slavery? And I would like to start with this because be before I started working on this, when I heard the word slavery, I was mostly thinking in terms of historical slavery. And so I thought it would be a good idea to give a short overview about this. And then I would like to turn to economic question and I would like to ask um, whether it is a good idea to end slavery. And there is an idea of a freedom or of an economic dividend and I will explore this. And then I will look at shocks um, and on one hand uh, globalization and trade liberalization and what they imply for uh, the prevalence of forced labor. And then um, within that framework, I will ask what transparency and supply chain measures do and whether they work. And lastly, um, I would like to say something about technological progress and forced labor. So um, let me start with the first part with an overview on modern slavery and uh, the policy responses. So here um, I have information from a website. So this is from Transparentum, which is an investigative, investigative uh, non-profit organization that investigates uh, human rights abuses in supply chains. And they look at Malaysia's textile and garment industries, and they document that migrants from uh, Bangladesh and Nepal pay recruitment fees in their home and destination countries. And these fees often lead to paralyzing amounts of debt for those workers. Those workers might sell um, land that they have in their home countries. They might go into debt and pay interest on that debt. And, and very often this is combined with deceptive recruitment. So uh, the employment is not what it is uh, supposed to be. Um, there are poor living conditions. Um, there's excessive overtime and perhaps unlawful deductions. And so um, this investigation concludes that uh, what they have found amounts to indicators of forced labor in the sense of what the International Labor Organization defines as uh, forced labor. OK, um, so this is just uh, an example. Now I would like to show you a definition and the definition says modern slavery are situations of exploitation that a person cannot refuse or leave because of threats, uh, violence, coercion, abuse of power or deception. Um, so I will use this definition as I go along because our empirical analysis relies on the Global Slavery Index from where I have taken this, this definition. And the Global Slavery Index is a joint um, effort by the War Free um, Foundation, by the International Labor, or Labor, Labor organization and the International Organization for Migration. And uh, so they try to um, give an ex estimate of the prevalence of forced labor and modern slavery in general in different parts of the world. And we, as I said, we will use um, this index. 
So um, let me talk about the prevalence of modern slavery. So this is from the Global Slavery Index. And so you see here in the middle of the slide, uh, there are around 40 million people in modern slavery in 2016. And um, this, um, when you only focus on the, um, on the countries that qualify for development assistance, this number uh, becomes 30 million. Now, there are 70% roughly female in modern slavery and 30% male. And um, when you split this up in forced marriage and forced labor, 15 million are in forced marriage and 25 in forced labor. So here's a map and I have on the next slide a slightly bigger map so you can see how this is distributed um, in the world. Um, modern slavery is highest here in Africa, um, but this is due to uh, forced marriage. And um, in this part of the world, um, the share of forced labor is highest. And um, so the prevalence lies between 3.6 and 4 per thousand in the population. You also see um, the top 10 countries highlighted here. So North Korea is followed by Eritrea and Burundi. And um, some of these countries have um, state forced um, um, uh, forced labor. So I, I forgot to say on the previous slide when I when I talked about 25 million people in forced labor, if you take away sexual exploitation and state sponsored forced labor, the number becomes 16 million. So the other thing that the Global Slavery Index does is it looks at slavery, at the risk to import slavery tainted goods into the G20. And the reasoning is um, that they think that the G20 countries are those that have uh, possibilities uh, to do something about this. So um, the top five products um, following this Global Slavery Index that are at risk of modern slavery are laptops, computers and mobile phones, garments in second place, and I will talk about garments later, fish at uh, three and cocoa and sugarcane in the fifth place. So based on this, the Global Slavery Index wants uh, to get those G20 um, countries to respond to this. And one of the recommendations that they make is uh, to address modern slavery in supply chains, and this is recommendation four here, and they ask for due diligence and transparency, both in public procurement, but also in private supply chains. And that brings me to uh, the political commitments. Um, of course, uh, modern slavery is a human rights issue, and um, the United Nations have an agenda for 2030, and that agenda specifies sustainable development goals and goal number eight is um, decent work and economic growth and this one has an, an, um, um, an annex that uh, is called 8.7 and this specifically mentioned forced labor and uh, modern slavery so i've printed this out here um, measures to eradicate forced labor, modern slavery, and human trafficking. Of course, there are also um, measures at the national level, and I would like to highlight uh, the Modern Slavery Act in the UK from 2015. So here you see a picture. Um, there are also other national efforts. For instance, Australia has a Modern Slavery Act. France has taken some measures. Um, Germany is about to uh, introduce a bill concerning those things. Uh, Spain, um, given that we also have a Spanish audience, um, has taken some measures and uh, the Global Slavery Index reports on the measures taken and, and, and Spain is in the groups that have taken uh, some measures. So in the uh, UK Modern Slavery Act, there's several things. For instance, an independent anti-slavery commissioner is, is being created. But I would like to highlight one policy response, and that is transparency and supply chain. Um, this is explained here. Um, this is the website of Fujifilm, and Fujifilm um, 
reports that the act requires companies of a minimum size, of a, of a certain size, to publish a statement describing what I've taken to ensure that there are no um, exploitation in their uh, supply chains. And then you can go on the website and you can download those statements here that you see at the bottom. And I will come back to transparency and supply chain measures as I go along. So now I would like to turn to the economic side of things. Um, but before I do this, I need to introduce two key ideas to the non-economists in the audience. And these are two key ideas from the very first uh, module in economics that we teach our undergraduates. And uh, that is very often called Economics 101. So let me introduce those two ideas. So first, um, economists use models. Here is a screenshot of an article by Axel Leonhufut, um, who is a Swedish economist, and he wrote this in the 70s. It is a mock ethnography, and it describes the practices, status, and taboos among economists. So he writes, life among the econ. The Econ tribe occupies a vast territory in the far north. Their land appears bleak and dismal to the outsider, and traveling through it makes for a rough sledding. But the Econ, through a long period of adaptation, have learned to wrest a living of sorts from it. And then he goes on and he writes, the Econ tribe is obsessed with mortals, sociocs and pulses don't use models. So the models are the highly stylized mathematical models that economists use. The sociologues and the policies are the sociologists and the political scientists who do not use models. And then he goes on and says, models are of no practical use, but they do increase a person's status. And since they increase status, I'm going to show you a model. Um, before I do this, let me also say that we all use models all the time in our daily life. So here's one. This is a map. Actually, it's a map of the Ruhr Valley that I talked earlier about. And this reduces complexities of real life to a few simplistic relationships. And of course, many things are neglected. The same is true here with the weather forecast for Leicester today. The art is to choose well what we include and what not. And the economists use those models and then use formalism or mathematical rigor to analyze them. So I will show you now a model and I will try to explain how this formalism looks like. So here's a model of production. And um, what it captures is the idea that if I increase my workforce, workforce that produces something, then I will produce more and more. So this is captured here by this picture. On the horizontal axis, you have labor or the number of workers that we have. And as I go along, more and more is produced. For instance, I, if I'm here and I have so many uh, workers hired, the area underneath the curve captures how many, um, how much I have produced. And if I have one more person, I move to the right and the area expands and I produce a little bit more. The key thing about this is that economists think that as I add workers, each worker produces less and less. So the function declines. But enough of economic gibberish in plain English. The curve is the, the answer to the question, what does an additional worker produce? Now, let me introduce a second key idea. And the second idea is that economists always think at the margin. So suppose you are in a sector, call it A for the advanced sector in an economy. And they, we want to decide whether to hire more workers or not. The principle of thinking at the margin means that we compare the additional or marginal benefits 
to the costs. The costs are easy because when I hire one more person, I have to pay the wage. And the additional benefits are what I had on the previous slide, what an additional worker produces, but I can sell this, so I have to multiply it by the price. So here in this picture, you see a blue line that looks like the one on the other slide, and it has now the interpretation that this is the value, not the quantity. And as long as this value is higher than the cost, which is the wage, I want to hire an additional person. So this vertical line tells you how many people I want to hire in this sector. And in plain English, the question that I'm looking at is, I'm, pl I'm planning to hire, say, five workers, but maybe I should hire one more. So as long as I'm on the left of this vertical line, the answer is yes. Yes, let's hire one more. If I'm to the right, when the blue line is, is underneath the orange one, uh, then I don't want to do this. And so these are the two key ideas that I need. I will now put them to work. So uh, let's get to the economics of forced labor. Suppose we have an economy and there are two sectors. There's an advanced sector A that produces, say, chemicals, and there's a traditional sector T that produces, say, garments. And for the moment, think about an economy without forced labor. So my strategy is that I first look at an economy without forced labor, and then I put forced labor in and I look what the difference is. Both sectors share the same workforce, L, and this is represented in this picture by the horizontal line. So depending how broad that is, um, so many people are in this economy. And what I'm concerned with is what is the share in the sector that produces chemicals and what is the share of workers in the other sector? And the answer that the picture gives me is this vertical line. And the reason is, as on the previous slide, so the advanced sector is here and they want to hire people until we get to this threshold. And I have drawn the the uh, traditional sector as a mirror image, so they hire from the right to the left. And so the first person they hire has a huge impact and it, it is a good idea to hire that person. And then we hire more and more and go to the left. So in this picture, this vertical line indicates what is the proportion of worker in the traditional sector? These are all these people here. And what is the other proportion in the other sector, which are these people here? So um, now I can introduce forced labor into this. So what is the key idea of forced labor? Well, um, the International Labour Organization writes that the key property is that people in forced labour receive wages that are lower than the market rate. So forced labour allows to pay less than in the market interaction um, would have to be paid. And Robert Wright says exactly, um, essentially the same thing. So let's introduce this. Suppose it's a traditional sector that is the one that produces garments, relies on coercion and pays a lower wage. So the labor costs there are now um, WT and you don't need to think of it as wage. It's it's the coercion cost. It's what it costs to put people into this condition and exploit them. The crucial thing is that this is less than the wage in the advanced sector. So our initial equilibrium was here and the initial partition was here in the middle of this picture. Now I have I, I have the possibility to pay less. So one wage goes down, the orange line goes down. And as it goes down, we, we will move to the left because this is the only way to move, to lower the wage and still have an intersection between the two lines. So the intersection, in the traditional sector, the one with forced labor, will move to the left. That will increase competition for workers and the wage for free labor goes up and the intersection also moves to the left. So the formalism and the rigor of the economic analysis tells me that unambiguously, the vertical line that separates the workers in the two sectors will move to the left. 
And so the people in forced labor will be more than in an economy without forced labor. And now that we know um, that um, what happens in an economy without force, uh, with forced labor, I can ask what happens to this economy? Um, do we want to end forced labor? And for this, I would like to introduce a uh, quote by, by Kevin Bales. Uh, Kevin Bales is professor of modern slavery in, uh, at the University of Nottingham, and he wrote 20 years ago um, this book, um, which was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. And he went undercover and talked to slaveholders and to slaves. And he says, ending slavery brings a clear freedom dividend and liberation soon pays for itself. And what he has in mind is that he looks at what happens when, um, when those people are freed and they take, more, they take part more in the local economy. They, um, part, they, they, they buy um, education, um, they care about healthcare, they stop environmental degradation, and he lists a, a long list of things um, that he um, summarizes as global benefits that makes the world a better place for everyone. And so this is what he calls the freedom dividend. All those things that he mentions are not in our model because our model focuses on very specific things. But there is something very similar in our economy um, and um, that has the spirit of the freedom uh, dividend. So let me show you what that is. And um, so here's my picture again. And you see that I have highlighted a shaded area here. And this area um, represents a freedom dividend that they have in, in our model, uh, which is conceptually different from what uh, Bales has pointed out. But it has the same spirit because I will argue that these are global benefits from ending slavery. Um, for the economists, the argument is very close to the one um, about uh, gains from trade. So how do I think about this? Well, when we go from an economy without uh, forced labor that has this partition here between the two sectors, and we go to one with forced labor, and then we have um, this amount. Uh, so this is a new separating line and everyone to the right is in conditions of forced labor. That means that the people here change from one sector to the next. So they go from the advanced sector uh, in free labor producing uh, chemicals to the traditional sector where they are in conditions of forced labor and produce garments. Now, in, in the advanced sector, this is what they produce, the blue line here. Whereas in the traditional sector, the orange line uh, indicates what they produce. So the shaded area indicates um, what is lost. And uh, this is a source of benefits for everyone, for the economy as a whole, um, if uh, slavery is ended. Um, so forced labor reduces the economy's choices and therefore um, there is an argument um, to end it, which is different from the fact that, you know, um, exploitation is and forced labor is illegal, illegal in every country and no uh, political group or religion uh, advocates to have it. This is not a moral or an ethical argument. This is an economic argument saying that there are possibilities to make everyone better off um, by ending um, slavery. So um, now I have described what the difference is in my model between an economy with forced labor and one without. Um, now I would like to look at shocks that affect the prevalence of forced labor. So um, this goes back to the initial slide, as was the initial quote that I had, where um, 
that person was worried about new trade agreements and whether they imply that uh, risk of tainted um, slavery goods will uh, be imported into the economy. So there are different views on globalization and uh, forced labor. And there is also the argument that I have highlighted before about supply chain transparency. So let me go back to the investigation by Transparentum. So here we are again. This is the same picture that I've shown you before. This is about Malaysia's textile and garment industries. And what happened is that um, after conducting the investigation, Transparentum confronted the buyers of that factory, which are 23 major apparel brands, um, with the findings. And 17 out of these apparel brands um, who had recent and ongoing buying and licensing relationships with the five factories took actions. Uh, first, they did audits, uh, which confirmed the findings, and then they uh, secured commitments for remediation. And uh, for instance, uh, the workers were reimbursed for the fees that they had paid um, in order to uh, to obtain those um, those jobs. Uh, so this is one um, example for uh, transparency in supply chains. Here's another that is a Good Weave International uh, certification label, and that assures that, so here you see the label on the picture, and um, the, um, the idea is that the label certifies that there has been no child forced or bonded labor in the production of that item. And so in order to obtain that item, uh, producers have to collaborate and permit auditings. And in order to, um, to put the right incentives, um, some retailers um, commit only to buy products that have that label. So the Good Weave certification label is, um, was formerly known as Rockmark uh, campaign. And Kevin Bales, who I have cited earlier, uh, describes that campaign and the power of that campaign uh, in the following way. Confronted with buyers from the retail chains who insist on slave free goods, the worst of the slaveholders leave the business and the other producers do what is necessary to earn the rug mark. It's a tremendous example of positive uh, consumer power. So um, this is an example uh, to say that in, in some countries, consumers um, direct their choices depending on ethical uh, considerations, and that then influences producers to change their practices. So as I said earlier, overall, there are two opposite views in the debate on globalization. And uh, there's a view that globalization and trade openness decreases the prevalence of forced labor. And there's also the view that trade openness increases the prevalence of forced labor. So on this slide, I have a selection of the arguments. And um, the first one that I have here um, relates to the previous slide. So, one view holds that trade openness decreases the prevalence of forced labor because globalization increases information sharing about working conditions and consumers force producers to eradicate forced labor. This is the idea of supply chain transparency that I had on the previous slide. And what we do with our model is that we um, can reflect those different opinions in the model. So I'm not going to show you this one, but I'm going to show you the blue one. So another reason for why trade openness decreases the prevalence for, of forced labor is because it provides the poor with sustained sources of income. So um, this is what I'm going to explain on the next slide, but let me also say that the model is able to rationalize the different sides of the debate. So after the blue uh, argument, I'm going to turn to the last one, which says that because of the, forced, uh, of the use of forced labor, some countries have a competitive advantage 
And that can lead then to a situation in which trade openness increases the prevalence of forced labor. So we'll show you how both are reflected in the in the model, and I will start with the first one. And um, that is the one that says that um, trade openness decreases the prevalence of forced labor because it provides the poor with sustained sources of income. So this will happen when openness to trade benefits the terms of trade of the sectors uh, that use uh, relatively um, much free labor. So let me show how this looks. So here's my picture again, and the dotted lines are my initial equilibrium. So this vertical line here is my initial partition of the workforce in forced labor and um, free labor. Now, as a result of trade openness, this line, which is dotted here, moves upwards to the blue line. And when that happens, the intersection with the wage must move to the right. And so the new partition will be here, and this chunk, this proportion of workers is represents the reduction in forced labor. So you can see if trade benefits this sector, then there will be a reduction in forced labor. However, as I said, the model can also um, rationalize the opposite argument that argues that forced labor gives the country a competitive advantage, the one that I hear if here at the bottom. And as a result, forced labor will increase. So this will happen when it is the other curve that shifts. So the other sector, the one that is intensive in forced labor, if that sector uh, benefits from trade, because then that shifts upwards and the intersection moves to the left. So we go from this partition here to a partition more to the left. And so the model says both things can happen. And um, it makes the prescription that says, you know, it depends on whether forced labor intensive goods improve or free labor defensive intensive goods improve. And um, we can therefore rationalize both calls for import prohibitions on products made using forced labor, but also um, the fact that some people have hope that trade opportunities induce economic progress. So the overall effect of trade on forced labor is an empirical question because it depends on how strong those countervailing forces are. So let me look at the, at the data. So here I have plotted um, a country's, a, a measure of forced labor here on the vertical axis. So this is a sl global slavery index. And on the horizontal axis, I have a measure for how open that country is to, to trade. And then on that plane, I place countries. So if a country is down here, that means it is not open, it doesn't have much forced labor. Whereas here, the country is both very open and has a lot of forced labor. In this area, like the Central African Republic or Burundi, you do not have a very open country, but you have high prevalence of forced labor. And down here, you would have an open country with a low prevalence of forced labor. So here you see Japan, Canada, Chile, Belgium, and Singapore. And overall, you see that this relationship is slightly negative. Now, um, the explanatory power of this is not great. And you also see that there's a lot of noise because for a certain level of forced labor, there are lots of countries here. Actually, you can't read the labels because they are one on top of the other. But you see there are many different levels of forced labor, which is what I have on the vertical axis, for a given level of, of openness. So please, um, um, so we, we look a little bit deeper, and I don't want to get into the... Um, um, into the details, but um, we um, look at this, we control for several things and use an instrumental burial approach, and this negative slope becomes positive. And so from this we learn that countries that trade more increase the use of forced labor, and this supports the validity of the concerns of anti-globalization Africa. But we also look at uh, the destination countries, 
And there are some that implement transparency in supply chain measures and others that don't. And we look at uh, low skill product. And um, this shows that uh, those measures, those transparency in supply chain measures are actually effective and can decrease the use of forced labor. And that attenuates the concerns of anti-globalization advocates. So um, this is um, the, um, the takeaway from our um, analysis of the effect of trade on, on forced labor, and it highlights uh, the transpar transparency in supply chain measures. So let me um, speak a couple of minutes only about another issue, um, another determinant of forced labor other than trade, and that is uh, technological progress. So economists think usually that uh, technological progress um, helps economic development and therefore developing countries to catch up with richer countries. And um, one might think that technology can also help to end human enslavement. And this is a this is a, a quote by Robert Wright, and uh, he has in mind the example of um, of the antebellum South and of cotton picking. So cotton picking was done by slave labor and it has been replaced by machines. And so that is the context of this. But it can also uh, happen that the opposite occurs. So here's an example also from the antebellum South, and that is the so-called cotton gin. And the cotton gin is the cotton engine. And it was a machine that quickly and easily separated cotton fibers from their seeds. And that was something that was initially done by slave labor. And so this machine did this. And it had the opposite effect. By the end of the 18th century, there were 700,000 uh, slaves. And uh, by 1850, that number had gone up to 3 million. And the reason is that this had changed the interplay, how workers and machines interact. This innovation allowed to lower production costs and as a result, the sector expanded. And um, that is the reason why um, the slave population expanded too. So what we do in this paper is to, um, to look at, an, at a model and to base to use classifications uh, that economists have of different types of innovations and how they interact, or what they imply for the interaction between um, workers and machines. And it turns out that the results indicate that the questions are complex. Some innovations can decrease the prevalence of forced labor and others can increase it. And that has obvious implication for, for policies that want to uh, incentivize the adoption of such technologies. So uh, let me skip the next slide and, and wrap up. Um, so in this lecture, I have explored how economics, economics can help to understand modern slavery. And the results indicate, and I have tried to make this point by, by showing you a couple of results that include that there is a global benefit from ending slavery that you might call the freedom dividend, um, that transparency in supply chain measures help reducing forced labor, and that technological progress can also help reducing forced labor. These results have important policy implications for the sustainable development goals for ILO conventions and for actions on modern slavery, both at the domestic and international level. So if I come back to the initial quote that I had on trade agreements, so the recommendation would be that we should include anti-slavery measures in new non-OECD trade agreements, of course, both the UK, but also other um, countries and uh, like the European Union or other um, groups of countries. So um, as is customary, um, my last slide is uh, to thank for the support that I have had um, throughout those years. Uh, let me perhaps just mention three mentors, Salvador, Luis and David. 
And also, um, let me just highlight uh, my uh, my two long-term co-authors, Jose and Nico. And um, I have down here a list of the uh, colleagues that I had over the years. Uh, thanks to them and thanks to my family for going to all these places with me. And of course, to both sets of, of grandparents for all their support uh, throughout uh, this time. So thank you very much for listening. And I hand back to you, Jim. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mateus, for that very stimulating and thought provoking talk. It's always great to see research that can have a positive policy impact and make a difference to the wealth, the welfare of many, many individuals. And that had the potential to be quite technical, but you made it as accessible as possible. So many thanks indeed. Many thanks also to Henrietta for her introductory remarks. Uh, and of course, finally, many, many thanks to all of you for attending today. I'm sure you found the talk as interesting as I did. Uh, I thank you again for coming and wish you a very pleasant evening. Thank you very much. And that concludes proceedings for this evening. Thank you. <laughs>